Okay. Okay. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome again to the series of discussions on the war in Ukraine, organized by the Institute of Political and International Studies. I am Attila Yosh, uh, an assistant lecturer of the Institute, and I will be the host of this discussion. <clears throat> Today, we will cover the topic of the American foreign policy regarding the war in Ukraine with Aaron Tabor. Aaron is an assistant lecturer of our institute and an expert of American foreign policy. So first of all, Aaron, thank you so much for being here. Um, the schedule of this discussion is the following. First, Aaron conducts a presentation which will take around uh, 40 or 45 minutes and then we will have a, a Q&A session. So feel free to ask. And I would like to inform everyone that we are recording the first part of this discussion, the presentation part, but the Q&A uh, session will not be recorded. Okay, I think we can begin our uh, discussion. So Aaron, uh, please share your slides. I, I hope you can see it now. Yes, yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you very much, Attila, for, for the introduction. And, and I also welcome everyone. Good afternoon. For, for this discussion. My topic is American foreign policy and the, the war in Ukraine. And before like starting anything, I, I would like to start with two caveats. One of them is, of course, we are talking about abstract things and foreign policies and, and, and all this, but, but we all can see that this war affects people. It has devastating consequences on the lives of people and uh, we can, we can see it from in Hungary as well, like uh, the effects of the refugees. So you can check on the website of the university how you perhaps can yourself help with your time, with your energies, with your resources uh, on the on for the refugees. And and um, I was just trying to say to think about how it affects people's lives, all the things that we will talk about. The second thing I wanted to, to mention is that, of course, the title is American Foreign Policy, and as Attila uh, said in the introduction, this is my area of expertise. But of course, I don't want to say that um, American foreign policy is the most important thing related to the war. You already listened to different uh, presentations before on the topic. And actually, at the end of today's presentation, I want to return to this issue that IR, of course, as a theory uh, and as um, discipline has some kind of a bias toward like American interpretations which overemphasize the role of the United States. So I I please don't take anything that I will say today as uh, an attempt to deny the agency of, of Ukrainians, of Russians, of uh, any kind of other actors. Still, we can say that the United States is an important actor in the international are arena which can uh, constrain, limit, uh, the, the, the circumstances in which other act actors operate. So from this perspective, it still makes sense to talk about uh, how American foreign policy affected the war and how it affects right now. So basically in this presentation, I will try to do three things. Uh, in the first part, this will be kind of an overview of events that led to the war in Ukraine and with focusing, as I mentioned, what the American side did, of course, and what they didn't do and how they tried to prevent or deter uh, Russia from invading Ukraine. In the second part, I will try to a little bit use uh, tools from foreign policy analysis to talk about issues like deterrence and compelence and understand better this part of American strategy. I see that some of you are here from my foreign policy analysis class. So for those, it will be kind of a repetition, but we've already discussed these things. And, and then the third part, I will talk a little bit about international relations theory and how we can interpret, uh, analyze these events from the perspective of theories. And of course, theory is a very broad thing. So I will focus mostly one particular theory of neorealism, which was mentioned uh, in a lot of time, uh, mentioned a lot of times in the previous days, uh, John Mersheimer's theory and what he said about Ukraine and the West and Russia, and perhaps what 
can we say as a criticism about this theory and, and perhaps what else IR can offer to understand better the, the recent events. So, of course, there is, uh, it, we can, there are multiple places and time times where we can start really this overview. There are, um, we, could, we, we could even go back to the end of the Cold War, we can go back uh, to the Orange Revolution, to the Maidan Revolution, to the occupation of Crimea and so on. Um, I don't want to go back that far. Instead, I want to start with with these events, which you can see on the picture right now, and which, of course, they they involve three important actors, two of them at the center of the war at the moment, President of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, and Vladimir Putin, of course, and Donald Trump, the former president of the United States. And I would just want to point out how American foreign policy before the war and before the recent events um, was involved in the decision making about Ukraine, about Russia, and put these actors in some kind of strange situation. So one of the pictures on the left side is from the meeting between Donald Trump and Zelensky, and we can even see from the picture that it was a kind of uncomfortable uh, meeting. Actually, this was the meeting when just before the meeting, it became uh, public what was in the phone conversation between uh, Putin, uh, sorry, between Trump and Zelensky, for which Donald Trump was later impeached in the United States Congress. And this was something which was, of course, a big kind of a scandal at the time, but even from the perspective of the events happening now, we can even understand the gravity of the situation better. So I don't know if you if you see the, the small screen, but these were parts of the discussions between like the closed phone call between Trump and Zelensky, where Zelensky was talking about uh, why the US, uh, why Ukraine needs reinforcement, weapons, uh, support, sanctions and everything from the US. And he said that we are almost ready to buy some javelins from the United States for defense pur purposes. And if you are following the news these days, you can know that these javelins became very important in the conduct of the war. And in the response, Donald Trump famously said that I would like you to do us a favor, though. And this was the topic of the investigation later, that Trump basically connected some kind of conditions, the, these kind of deals with Ukraine, related to American foreign policy and related to Trump's own obsession about what happened. He was under investigation, of course, at that time because of uh, the 2016 election and the Russian interference and his own uh, in obsession that perhaps there was a server in Ukraine somewhere. Um, there was, uh, uh, these were all unsubstanti unsubstantiated reports, but he still believed that that, that would somehow prove him true if that could be found. And also he was suggesting uh, some kind of an in investigation against the former vice president of the United States, his potential opponent for the next election, who is of course the current president of the United States, Joe Biden. So in this sense, we can see that Zelensky himself kind of unexpectedly became involved in a domestic political match within the US, something which we try to avoid as he was, of course, interested in how the United States uh, would support him. And now we know that there were reasonable fears that Ukraine needed to, to strengthen its defense. In the other picture, we, we saw it was actually a year earlier. So the first meeting was in, in the fall of 2019. The other is from uh, the summer of 2018. Uh, I think it was July. And yes, uh, the meeting in Helsinki between Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin. And here we so see two leaders who are more friendly toward each other, even though the US and Russia didn't have very good relationship under Trump presidency either. And Trump himself talked about this, that uh, he called Putin a competitor, although he said a good competitor. And it was a friendly atmosphere. In some ways, uh, Trump, uh, in this press conference with Putin, he basically contradicted his own secret service, uh, its own uh, uh, 
uh, intelligence, uh, what the United States by then made public that uh, U.S. intelligence sources uh, um, proved, or at least uh, confidently assumed that uh, Russia was behind the interference of the 2016 election campaign, and Trump basically in front of the journalist on the side with, side, with, with Putin on his side announced that he believes what Putin was saying and why, why shouldn't he believe Putin. So I just show this kind of starting point because if we want to understand US foreign policy, which happened in the last year and what is going on right now, perhaps with, with regard to Ukraine, we need to think about as well what was the uh, what were the preceding events? How did we get to this point? And during the Trump presidency, Russia reasonably assumed that the United States was divided over Ukraine, although there was support coming to Ukraine, but uh, it is not. It was not a support at the highest level. And on the other hand, Trump uh, multiple times expressed his admiration about Putin. And in any kind of question, when when it was suggested that maybe Putin is kind of is a leader who kills his opponents, for example, Trump said that yes, the United States is doing a lot of killing as well, doing a kind of a moral equivalency, which is regarding recent news about about a, uh, suspect, suspected war crimes in in Ukraine. Again, shows a, le a different level, even though. Trump was right in the sense that the U.S. was also committing certain atrocities, but taking himself at the level of Putin was also a signal about American foreign policy uh, regarding Ukraine. So the next question what I, I can ask or we can ask, what was really Trump's strategy? And I use the, um, use the quotation marks because it's, of course, we are talking of Trump and, and it is even questionable whether he really had a strategy in mind or anything like a strategy. But if we try to put together what was the foreign policy during the Trump three years, and for this I uh, use what Alexander Cooley and Daniel Nixon used in his book about, and their book about exit from hegemony, the so-called unraveling of the American global order gives us some kind of a picture what went uh, on during this this time. So, based on some kind of based on some announcements of the U.S. and what Trump was saying and other policymakers were saying, we can say that one of the things what, which was a major element of Trump's strategy was to rather focus on China instead of the threat coming from Russia. This is not. This was not Trump's own idea. We can even say that it was a so-called realist argument in the sense that it was shared by many policymakers, and it went back even to the Obama years when the idea came that the United States needs to rebalance, reposition, or pivot its interests to the Pacific. China will be the most important competitor, and even some levels at foreign policy circles within the United States assumed that in the long term, Russia is also interested in constraining China because Russia would be a second rate power in the sense compared to China and Russia is also perhaps uh, threatened by the, the rise of China if it, it's happening too, too rapidly. So in this sense, there was a general agreement and it was not just characterizing Trump, although Trump was very vocal about this idea that the U.S. needs to focus on China. Of course, he had a particular approach about the trade war of China, which was not necessarily shared with everyone, but, but at, at least this kind of idea of repositioning American foreign policy was not uh, very much contested or debated. On the other hand, another element of Trump's strategy, which we, again, Cooley and Nixon uh, demonstrated in their analysis what Trump did during his presidency was weakening the foundations of the American alliance structure or the so-called liberal international order, if it existed, existed at all. Uh, perhaps it's not the, the, the time to go into these details, the debates, but of course that was again a question. In any, any case, there is kind of evidence that the United States uh, policymakers try to uh, convince Trump 
there are even testimonies that uh, his main like defense secretary Jim Mattis and uh, national security advisors, they try to convince him that the US needs to support its allies. And based on what Trump did in his rhetoric, he was not really uh, taking this seriously. So this was something which was not shared by many others. And in this sense, it could be seen as a weakening of the the, the foundations of the alliance structure and everything which uh, in the environment in which the, the United States operated in the end, after the end of the Cold War. Regarding Ukraine, we can see that his administration was divided at, at the level of bureaucracy and even at the State Department, at the National Security Council, we could find many people who really advocated for strengthening and strengthening the support to Ukraine. And this in some ways happened uh, we know that the Trump administration was the first one which provided lethal weapons to, to Ukraine. But at the same time, uh, we can also see that uh, the support was not coming in a political sense from the top, or at least was not entirely clear, because as I mentioned, Trump had this obsession about investigation about him, about the so-called servers and everything that uh, people saw that he was too close to, to Russia. And, and also his advisors actually had these kind of shady connections with, with, within Ukraine and Russia. And we know about uh, Paul Manafort, who was one of his campaign, campaign managers, who was a consultant in Ukraine before the Maidan revolution, an advisor to the Yanukovych government, which was toppled by the revolution later. And also Rudy Giuliani had this kind of strange trips to Ukraine, to Russia, trying to find some kind of evidence which proves the Trump, Trump's theory about the events, domestic events. So this again shows that somehow this kind of domestic political events of the US got involved in this, in this whole, uh, whole uh, situation in Ukraine. And we, we know that there were some uh, Ukrainian and Russian businessmen who just in the past weeks, they were convicted, or at least they are accused of doing illegal campaign for fi uh, for financing in the United States. So this was also uh, part of this whole issue. And I just have one quote from this period by, by Cooley and Nixon saying that what Trump has done was a series of half measures that risked weakening the American system and facilitating illiberal order contestation but without any grand bargain that might produce strategic upsides. So they basically argue that Trump was doing the worst of both words in the sense that it was not enough for Putin to make some kind of a big deal. We know by now what were Putin's really uh, demands toward the West, like going back to NATO, uh, stop aiding Ukraine, uh, NATO should leave back to its like NATO military forces should should leave back to 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 the 1997 situation. This was not something that Trump could could give. Perhaps he personally would have given, but not the American domestic system would would have uh, made it possible. But at the same time, he still weakened the 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 whole liberal order and. If we ask the question, because this is again often asked, why this kind of invasion, which was see, didn't happen during Trump's presidency, we can we can Trump, of course, himself is now saying that because Trump was so strong against Russia that Putin didn't dare to attack Ukraine during his presidency. But it is more likely what his former national security advisor John Bolton is saying that Trump was perhaps if he had been re-elected, he probably would have uh, moved even further from the alliance, perhaps even uh, withdrawing the US from NATO and so on, and uh, having an even better circumstances for Russia for such an action against Ukraine. So in some sense, we can say that Putin acted perhaps now because he waited during the Trump presidency, whether the situation will get even better for, for him. And then came, of course, the Biden administration. And this is, again, another meeting between an American president and, and Vladimir Putin now in last June in Geneva. 
when we observe what Biden was doing when he was talking to Putin, we can see that Biden was uh, elected as president with, with the aim of having doing a big shift in foreign policy. Uh, his meeting with Putin was, a, was actually part of a bigger trip when he met with allies in NATO, in, in Brussels, in different parts of the world, and he tried to reassure everyone that America was back. On the other hand, we also see that there were some kind of continuities, and perhaps we can say that this is a very good test for structural theories of international relations, because we cannot even find two like more opposing personalities than Trump and Biden, different ideologies and so on. What is constant is, of course, the international structure. And we could see that Biden himself was a continuation in the sense, not in the sense of the alliances, he tried to strengthen the alliances, but in the sense that China was the main, main threat against uh, US and he was not really interested in doing a deterrence directly against against Russia. So in this, after this meeting with Putin, Biden had a press conference and basically he had one sentence about Ukraine, that the US is committed for the territorial integrity of Ukraine, but this was not the most, the most important part. And actually after this press conference, uh, Biden was asked why he was sure that Putin he would change his behavior because that was the main aim of the meeting that somehow Putin change his behavior because already uh, uh, the relations between Russia and the US were quite bad one, when Biden was elected. And, and Biden was responding that he is not sure about whether he will, he will change, but he, he talked about how uh, Russia is a very, in a very, very difficult spot right now. They are being squeezed by China. They want desperately to remain a major power and you all are writing about not illegitimately that Biden gave Putin what he wants, legitimacy. And he, they are desperately, so Putin desperately wants to be relevant. So what we can see from this that Biden was basically saying that trying to continue that kind of foreign policy, which try to ease the relations with Russia regarding to China, perhaps breaking the China-Russia alliance, but of course, he was quite different in the sense that he was more vocal about human rights, about opposition and, and about the support of Ukraine. In this meeting, actually, Biden said after this meeting that he gives six or to 12 months until it becomes clear whether Russia would change, whether Putin is open to some kind of a strategic dialogue. And of course, it turned out that it, it was, was not really the case. So what happened between that meeting and, and the run up to the war? Uh, I just mentioned two episodes because I think this is important in the sense to understand what happened in the US and its relation to allies and perhaps what influenced the calculations of Vladimir Putin. We saw the withdrawal of the US from Afghanistan, which was criticized by many of the allies, the way it was done, not necessarily the fact that the US withdrew its troops and the lack of coordination between the United States and some of its key allies. And another episode happened in the fall last year when Biden announced a submarine deal with Australia. Again, we could see that it was uh, targeting mostly China uh, and this kind of UK, US, Australian deal again showed that there is some kind of a division uh, within the Western Alliance. France was, of course, obviously uh, the most furious about it because it was the cancellation of the previous deal between France and Australia. Uh, so what we can see that perhaps based on that, one, one could have said that it is a good time for Putin to invade because the West is weak, has weakened. It didn't entirely recuperate from from the divisions during the Trump presidency and uh, and uh, the alliance perhaps is not, not so strong. So we have to understand everything which happened after in the framework of this and in light of, of these facts. And what I want to, to say, see, say here is um, 
Of course, we can ask the question, what were Biden's attempts to deter the Russian invasion? And this part is very much based on an article of the New York Times. And of course, Washington Post also had reports. So we are very well informed about what were really the calculations of American foreign policy decision makers. We know that by October 2021, they had credible intelligence information about a possible attack on Ukraine. And this started a new phase between American foreign policy and Ukraine. And perhaps if we can criticize American foreign policy up until this point, we can say that some of the American actions were belated. There is generally a consensus about among experts that what comes after this point was, was very well organized. And even though it was not enough, uh, and perhaps there was not enough at, under any conditions to change Putin's calculations that they, at least they were managed to they managed to like raise the cost of the war uh, for Putin. So what were these choices choices by Biden? One of them was to really reinforce this alliance, to be prepared for a collective response. And what we we can see right now that it was kind of successful because even American policymakers were surprised by the speed how not just the U.S. but other actors, the EU, and so on. Uh, even Switzerland and even Asian, uh, East Asian countries like Japan, Singapore joined some of the sanctions. So in this sense, we see that the US and Biden put much effort from the fall of 2021 to uh, re reinforce these, uh, the alliance and, and somehow uh, overcome the previous problems. One of these tools was, was that intelligence information was much was used very widely by the Allies. So basically it is not a very standard thing, but during the G20 summit, near like at the G20 summit in Rome, Biden uh, shared intelligence information with his closest allies. So the UK, uh, Italy, Germany, France, and and also the, the leader director of national intelligence in the US, Avril Haynes, she shared information with all the NATO members. Usually the downside of such a sharing information is, of course, that especially if you share it with 29 other NATO governments, then you cannot be sure uh, whether this, how it will be, uh, who will hear this information. The US doesn't trust necessarily all the, the allies that they will keep uh, secret this information. But this part was mitigated by the second element of Biden's strategy, which was the so-called radical transparency regarding publicizing intelligence information. Starting from December and especially with January 2022, Biden became very open about the, the exact threats and not just Biden, but, but the UK joined this efforts as well, publicizing pre, uh, information what the Russia would, would do, do perhaps, like what kind of fake uh, incidents they would make up to to justify an invasion. And publicizing this information was not enough, of course, to deter Russia. We will talk about that. But it was still enough for, um, it was still contributed again to neutralizing Russian propaganda once the war break, broke out and to uh, mobilizing the, uh, the allies in the sense that it was clear that Biden already uh, made not just the allied government, but the general public aware about uh, such a threat. And I think this was a crucial part why Russia was really losing the information war even before the war really, really started. And the third part was increasing arms sales, uh, especially after the failed December video call with Putin. So in December, there was another attempt with, with Biden and Putin to talk about things and that Biden was seriously saying like what kind of consequences it will have if Russia will go on with the invasion. And there is information that there, there was a 200,000, uh, sorry, 200 million uh, uh, dollar aid, military aid program, which was accepted by the US, but still frozen in December, using this kind of as a bargaining chip for Putin against Putin saying that if uh, he doesn't withdraw his troops or doesn't uh, uh, doesn't uh, withdraw from his intention of invasion, then perhaps they, they will use these tools. These were 
really strengthened by the diplomatic effort. So the CIA director, William Burns, was sent to Moscow in November again, using partly these kind of open cards, saying that this is the information that the United States had, and they know what Putin was planning, and allowing some, some kind of, 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 a, of, a, of a chance for, for retreat. So, and, and from that, we know, of course, that this strategy was itself not enough to have consequences in the sense to deter Russian actions. Um, now I just want to talk very briefly about what we know from theory about deterrence and compliance, and this is uh, Janice Stein's article I use. We, for those who are in the, the foreign policy analysis class, we, we had this text about deterrence and compliance in the Gulf. It, it, uh, it, she examines the, the, the case of the first Gulf War when the US was not able to deter Saddam Hussein and not able to compel Saddam Hussein. So what these two things mean? That the first one, deterrence, means that they try to convince someone not to do something. So in this case, they dissuade someone from doing something. So in the sense, like saying, convincing Putin not to invade uh, Ukraine. Compellence means that once the invasion happens, what can the US, or once the invasion in Iraq happened, what can the US do to make the other actor to change its course? And unfortunately for the current times, one of the main conclusion of Stein's article is compellence is always more difficult than deterrence. It's not very surprising, given that once a leader has committed to a certain cause, once the leader has decided, made a decision, it is more difficult to convince the leader to change their course. So if the US, if Russia hadn't invaded Ukraine, uh, Putin could have still said that like it was not in, he, he didn't really plan to do this. Now that the decision was made, it's much more difficult and costly for him to back down. So. In this case, we can basically ask two things, what the US can do and, and what, why deterrence has failed. And again, Stein's research gives us some clues. One of the questions we can ask whether signal, there were mixed signals. Before the Gulf War, there were actually mixed signals about US intentions. So we can say that uh, US and Russia, uh, by that uh, in that case, in the Gulf War, uh, the United States was at the same time reassuring Saddam Hussein that they would not militarily intervene, but still uh, maintaining the alliance with Kuwait. It was kind of the mixed signal which always makes deterrence unlikely to, to succeed. In our case, deterrence was not failing because mixed signals actually, at least after October and November, when the intelligence information became clear, Biden was very clear about what happens if there is an invasion. So perhaps another question is whether threats were not credible. Perhaps this is more convincing. Previous experiences on sanctions were that, yes, they were imposed on Russia, but that they weren't necessarily so harsh. Uh, and, and Russian economy already was independent to some extent to those sanctions. So perhaps this can raise, uh, like it can uh, increase the risk taking of Putin, that he was not afraid very much about the threats, and also, as I already talked about, this perceived disunity of the West. And the final point we have to make is whether there was any clear inducement. So we know from Russian official statements that they believe that sanctions would have come in any case, of course, not this extent of sanctions, but from Daniel Dresner, another expert on sanctions, it's important to to know that for sanctions to, to work, they have to be two credible commitments. One is them that the targeted actor has to do something, uh, that if they will be imposed if the targeted actor does something. And the second one is that sanctions will be lifted or not imposed if the targeted actor reverses course. So I think that's important to see that and it is also a criticism to current sanctions, but of course we already had Victor with the presentation more, much more details about sanctions. It's a criticism that as long as it is not clear what Russia needs to do to sanctions to be lifted, it is not clear whether they have any kind of effect. 
So in the end, we can ask the question whether deterrence was possible at all. And perhaps we can say that Russia and Putin was already made this decision, had already made this decision about the invasion. Even if they were not possible to, to, to deter the action, we can conclude that the US was able to raise the price of Putin's wars. And even offering some kind of an off-ramp, um, we can think about America's radical use of intelligence information in this sense that it offered a chance for Putin to withdraw without losing prestige. Uh, even if just after Putin makes his speech about the, like the recognition of the separatist regions of Donbass and uh, in Donbass, he could have even just had a limited incursion, like securing this this region, but not uh, a full-scale invasion. And that would have been an embarrassment for U.S. intelligence. And in this sense, it could have been uh, announced as a propaganda victory for Russia, because then it, the U.S. didn't was not right about its prediction about an invasion. So in this sense, we can understand the, the American strategy this way, that it gave a chance for Putin to withdraw without losing uh, prestige. And, and this is also how perhaps we can understand Biden's so-called gaffe, or what a lot of people then thought, thought about, that he misspoke about minor inclusion, with, uh, minor, sorry, uh, minor incursion, not inclusion, uh, about, about uh, to, to, to the Donbass. Basically, Biden was saying that if Russian force is just entering the Donbass region and not the whole of Ukraine, that has a, not a smaller scale of, kind of sanctions, and it allowed some kind of uh, a possibility for like the the proportions of the sanctions uh, would would be like the sanctions would be proportional to to the actual invasion and and attack. So in this sense, uh, we can understand that perhaps this was to some extent intentional to signal that if Biden was convinced by that time that this invasion was already decided, if Putin decides just for a limited invasion or incursion, then it would have a different result, which, which happened. And finally, the question, what can sanctions really achieve now? Deterrence failed. As I mentioned with compellence, the problem, whether there are specific aims, uh, it is not entirely clear what the US wants to do. And, and with regard to regime change, which some people are talking about, it is, I'm not an expert on this, but if we are reading the literature, it, it is very unlikely, at least on the short run, to happen in, in Russia. So this is part of the things which, or, although experts are saying that American foreign policy was, was quite, quite clear uh, and effective in some ways, like increasing the Russian cost, at some point, they have to make it clear what is their goal with the sanctions, what are the conditions of lifting the sanctions, uh, how Russian behavior can can shift the sanction, or or is it just part of a long term game of of punishing Russia? And this is, of course, yesterday uh, Zelensky talking to to the U.S. Congress, and I see it, it is a it is a, a very big contrast to the first picture when I said that Ukraine was understood in the terms of the domestic policies of politics of the US. And now we saw that basically all major parties, even Trump saying uh, that he was not necessarily wrong, uh, like he was not supporting Russia. Uh, so we may say that that it was again another miscalculation from the part of Russia that that understanding the division within the West and within the United States, it's domestic division, they assumed that there would be not a, a, not that that strong reaction, but but if if we see what and what what was uh, Zelensky talking yesterday, uh, it is again very interesting that he he basically talked about how uh, first of all he mentioned humanitarian no-fly zones, something that Russia uh, like something they they want. Uh, but of course, we know that a no-fly zone would be basically America entering into the war. They have to shoot down Russian planes and so on. This is a very, very dangerous escalation. So immediately after that, he made, he made another demand that if this is not something which the U.S. can offer, they want different kinds of defense system, different 
kind of support in the battlefield. And this is, of course, what we see happening by then announcing another, uh, just to see the proportions that I talked about, the $200 million do uh, uh, aid in, in December, but now announcing another $1 billion of military aid. So it increased very rapidly. And this is perhaps what experts like, this is a new blog post by Daniel Dresner saying, that perhaps it was underestimated that in some ways the US foreign policy system still works and, and, and was, at least according to experts, quite effective in doing certain things, but of course couldn't really prevent or deter the aggression. Um, I ask Attila how much time should I have or should I perhaps stop here? Around four or five minutes left, if, if it's okay. Right, then then I will we'll talk very briefly about IR theory and perhaps for those of us who are interested, we can we can turn back to the questions about this. I just want to very briefly discuss this point by John Mersheimer, uh, because this is this is of course one of one of the articles I think we also often teach in our classes to show how realism works and understand something. But we can see that it has real life consequences as the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Russia also uh, used it as a reference on Twitter. So, of course, Mersheimer cannot be made held responsible for that, like how Russia uses his research. But it's still interesting that his points were, were taken out by, by Russians. Of course, for those of you who haven't still seen this, this article or in other forms, these videos are now all over the internet about Mersheimer. So his point is that it is basically a liberal foreign policy decision, which was the provocation of Russia. He has this realist point of view, which says that decision makers overestimated and liberals, because they were influenced by liberal worldview, overestimated the power of democracy and institutions. But we are still living in like a realist world and from a from this kind of geopolitics 101 perspective, we should accept that great powers are always sensitive to potential threats near their home territory. And from this argument, so I'm still talking about Mersheimer's argument, NATO enlargement created fear of encirclement uh, for Putin. So this is kind of like a general case of the security dilemma that Putin was afraid uh, that the West is increasingly getting closer to, to Ukraine uh, and to Russia, of course. And because of it, they also increase their arm and also do something uh, aggressive, perhaps. What is the problem with this argument? I'm just, just go, I don't go for the details about the, the offensive realism. You uh, learn about school, what is the difference between offensive and defensive neorealism. Um, in Mersheimer's uh, article, what is interesting is if we take his offensive realist perspective, it is not entirely clear whether Russia would have left alone Ukraine in any case. So we can say that actually from his point of view and from his theory, perhaps we can say that NATO expansion was not necessarily this kind of like idealist or liberal option, but it can be said as an alliance building measure, which is a realist behavior balancing against another great power. So I would just say that Mersheimer, who is an offensive realist in this piece, interestingly, he makes an argument which is very similar to what defensive realists say. Uh, in this part, which I copied out, I don't read the whole stuff. It's he says in detail about uh, why is it dangerous for like, why is it not really the interest of uh, of, of Russia to really go and occupy Ukraine. Uh, so everything which is happening now, already in 2014, Mersheimer said that uh, Russia lacks the capability to easily conquer and annex Eastern Ukraine, not to speak of the whole country, and so on. So in this sense, he talked about Putin as a defensive realist. And then, of course, it is not a problem, but what, whether this is supposed, supported by, by the facts. And I just leave it here that when we talk about neorealism, perhaps it's, it's better to think about what Kenneth Watts talks about, how the system punishes certain actors who act against systemic pressures. 
Perhaps this is a better description from a realist word that Russia is more likely to be punished at the moment, it seems, by the system because of its behavior. So already what we see that there are those kind of self-fulfilling prophecies, how NATO is rearming itself, Russia is increasingly isolated, and basically the, the whole thing which I started the presentation that the US repositioning its foreign policy toward the Pacific is, is put on pause right now because the US or again committed resources to Europe. This is something which was not really uh, not really likely before this attack. So in some sense, we can say that what happened, what Putin tried to prevent perhaps with his action, if we accept this realist argument, is exactly causing that effect that, that he wanted to prevent. And in this sense, at least from a realist perspective, at least if we want to explain this way, it doesn't seem to be a very, very good calculation. And actually just my final point, uh, I don't go into the details about those. Uh, if we are talking about Mersheimer's argument, we can ask about those whether the West really made such promises to Russia about NATO enlargement. It is not clear that these promises were made. What, where, do, where, goes, where, where, where is the agency of all the other actors? So Putin himself had a choice, and this is what other people say, that we shouldn't just see from an American perspective such a, such a decision. And I just raised some ideas about how we can go beyond the realist framework, talking about democracy, regimes, norms, prestige or national narratives, which perhaps as important to, to explaining the events as, as the realist framework. And I think this is where I, I want to, to finish right now. So I'm, of course, looking, looking forward to any kind of question.